everyone. We are about to start. So today I will share a colloquium. It will be given by like Oliver Newton, who was supposed to give this talk first in June. Then I had to say uh, sorry to Queen because and there was a problem with, uh, with dates, with other speakers and the upcoming uh, summer. So it was postponed to the 1st of October, <laughs> but then uh, another speaker appeared and uh, another idea for the colloquium. So fortunately, finally we have Oliver today and he will tell us about who's uh, postdoc in CFT. Recently he managed also to apply with a Sonata project. Hopefully it will be successful. And now it's time for you to tell us about exploring the local group with constraint simulations. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it's been a long time coming. And actually the uh, the, the, the paper to which, or about which the, the results in, in this has been published all the way back in March last year. So it's been a long time coming. It's nice that I'm finally able to, to present some of these results. Um, but given that this is a kind of not, not such a seminar, I'm, I'm going to be very, very light touch and very broad, uh, at least to begin with. Um, so that at least for, for those of you who maybe don't come into contact with astrophysics on the daily, uh, in the way that I do, for example, or perhaps haven't dealt with it in detail since your bachelor days, which may or may not have been particularly recent, um, hopefully you can come away with something from this that shows you might be more interesting or otherwise. So, so this, this is how I'm planning to uh, sort of go about this, this equilibrium. And as a kind of attack for this, if you like, I'm, I'm intending to summarize our present understanding of or what we believe to be our understanding of how the universe evolves, um, which is encapsulated within what's known as the Lambda CDN model. Uh, I'll discuss some of the evidence for that as well. Then I'll go on to motivate well, why we need simulations, which is of course of interest for, for, for this talk and uh, the context of constraint simulations, and some of the problems that are starting to emerge with Lambda CDN will have emerged uh, over the last few decades on what we call small scales. That's what I mean. And then I'll introduce the simulations that I used for the, for the work I published last, last year um, and present the actual results of that work, which are. Uh, with all of these galaxies and other groups. So these are, one of a better word here, a class of objects that are uh, a class of galaxies that are relatively low mass. They have masses similar to the, the masses of the brightest uh, satellite galaxies that orbit our own galaxy of the Milky Way. Um, but their sizes are much larger, more on the scale of the Milky Way itself. And as a result, they're very diffuse objects, quite hard to observe, but they're, they're interesting for various reasons, <laughs> which I'll, I'll come to a bit later on. So, I think our, our current understanding of the universe, as I said, is based on the lambda CDM model. So, lambda here means the topological constant. It arises through Einstein's scale equations and is responsible for the expansion or driving the expansion of the universe. And CDM here stands for cold dark matter, which is a component of this model that we think we need in order to explain the, the evolution of the universe that we see. So in this picture, the universe begins in a, a very hot, uh, dense state, uh, and as a, as a homogeneous, or roughly homogeneous mixture of photons and matter in coupled together in a, in a plasma. Shortly thereafter, uh, the universe experiences what's called uh, inflation, which smooths out density fluctuations in this early plasma, but also in, in fins, uh, through quantum fluctuations uh, in, the, in the field of the drives that we think drives this inflation, inflationary epoch. There are density variations in, in plasma uh, that ultimately go on to seed the sites of galaxy formation, star formation, and so on. Uh, and act, act as the, the centers around which or into which uh, mass accumulates uh, under the action of gravity later on. During this inflationary epoch, of course, the plasma expands and the process cools. Um, and so after, after about 40,000 years, we get to the point where 
as, as the plasma is expanding and cooling, fundamental particles start to precipitate, to precipitate out there. They're able to form the conditions in the plasma are conducive to the formation of fundamental particles and then onwards to baryons and so on. At about 400,000 years, uh, the plasma is cool enough at about 3,000 Kelvin. It's about half the temperature of the surface of the sun. Uh, for the photons in this initial plasma to decouple from, from the electrons and baryons, which are combined into neutral atoms, generally of hydrogen, mostly of hydrogen, I should say. And the universe becomes transparent. So you have the universe filled with neutral atoms and radiation, it's cosmic background radiation uh, that propagates freely through this, through this universe. And then not very much observable happens from this point onwards. So this, this radiation captures essentially a snapshot in time of the state of the universe at this point. Um, and when we look out into the universe today, it appears to come to us fairly homogeneously from all directions. Um, and this, as the universe expands, and this radiation cools, will come to be known as the cosmic microwave background. And I'll return to that in a minute. Um, so we're now in what's known as the dark ages, where your, your universe is filled with neutral, neutral atoms. There's no other source of radiation at all uh, beyond this background radiation sloshing around. Um, and the only thing that really happens during this time is that you have under the action of gravity from at least the start of the emergence of structure, uh, which later becomes known as the cosmic web. And this continues for the first 100 billion years, approximately until you've accumulated in some of these over-dense regions enough of this material, this baryonic material, that you can start, the conditions are good enough that you can start to form stars and galaxies. This happens very rapidly, and all of a sudden the universe lights up and the galaxy formation does not begin, and continues pretty much all the way through to the present, all the way through to the present day, for the next 13.8 billion years. The universe continues to expand during all of this time, uh, driven by, as I, as I mentioned, this cosmological constant. And for, for most of the universe's history, this has been dominated by, by mass, been driven by gravitational attraction and so on. We found in, in the last few decades that uh, in relatively recent times, this has started to change and the evolution of the universe is increasingly dominated by this cosmological constant which is driving an accelerated expansion of the universe. The universe is expanding quicker and quicker um, than, than before, driven by this. So, I mean, put all, this is our current picture. Um, but the, the, the way we, we, one of the ways we can go about trying to fit them all to this, I would say, Lambda, Lambda CDM tells us all this, but uh, we want to be a little bit more positive. In, in being able to model uh, the evolution of the universe. And so one way to go about this is looking at this cosmic microwave background. So as I mentioned before, this is a snapshot of, in time, of the state of the universe at about 100,000 years after the Big Bang. And the universe continues to expand and cool, uh, and all of this, this radiation uh, cools with the expanding universe. And so today, at the present time, the temperature of this, well, on average, the temperature of this is about 2.7 Kelvin. So for those who are not familiar, this is basically a 360 degree view of the sky. You put a microwave uh, antenna up and you look at 360 degrees. This is what you will measure. This is from the, the Planck satellite. Um, you can use measurements from the Planck satellite, which doesn't actually fit. Uh, and these, these speckles of different colors represent fluctuations from this average, from this average temperature that have been enhanced with a visual, better visual contrast. Um, but the scale of these fluctuations is around 10 to the minus 5 Kelvin. Mm. So they're, they're actually pretty tiny, which is basically a homogeneous, essentially. But, but it, it, these tiny little fluctuations that are the seeds of later structure formation, so they're, they're quite important. And what you can do, uh, if you have a model of how the universe evolves, that makes predictions for, for statistically what this will look like, you can look <coughs> at the power spectrum of the fluctuations on different angular scales. You compare the sub-angle, the amplitude of the fluctuations across this entire map. 
and we can use this to um, to calibrate to to find the best fitting model at least a lambda CDM that that explains this result. And so if we go away and do this like this up, um, the data points from from that background map from fact we're given here in, in these these points here, and the best fitting lambda CDM model is given by this this fit and this solid line here. Um, so this is looking at the, the, the size of the different temperature fluctuations on different angular scales across. I'm not going to go into too much more detail on this, although I'm happy to discuss this over coffee or um, lunch or other points if you really want to go into why there are these wiggles and other bits and pieces. Um, but finding this better physical model, what this tells us is that within Lambda CDM, in order to have a universe that behaves like this, uh, we need about 5% of the universe to be composed of standard model particles that make up you, you and I. Another about five times more in a, in a sort of undetected component of dark matter. So this doesn't appear to interact with standard model particles, at least not via electromagnetism, perhaps via the weak force, but again, nothing's been detected so far. The only thing that we do see is that it interacts via gravity, and we see its effects on the 5% of the universe that we can visually see uh, or detect. And then there's this enormous component of dark energy, which the only thing about it is it drives the accelerated expansion of the universe. Um, and so within Einstein's field equations has some negative pressure. Um, we know nothing else beyond that. So some could argue it's a bit of a uh, nuisance parameter in some way, perhaps, but it's essential this is, this is the essential composition that we need in order to reproduce the universe that we observe. And so if you take all of that and put it into a, a simulation, solving the equations of gravity, um, and perhaps with some prescription to, um, to try to model the 5% the of the universe and the interactions that take place um, within that, then you end up forming this quite complex and rather beautiful elementary structure known as the cosmic web. So on the left hand, this is the illustrious simulation. On the left hand side, you have the dark matter component of the universe uh, evolving under gravity and coalescing into <laughs> see, these different nodes connected by slightly lower density elementary structures um, surrounding large void regions of relatively empty <laughs> space. On the right hand side, you have, in this case, the gas temperature, which is something of a sort of a proxy for what you might expect to see galaxies forming. And you can see that there's quite a, a large disparity between how dark matter evolves on the left-hand side and certainly the, the gas evolves on the right. And if you take that as a bit of a proxy for where you expect to find galaxies, you can see it's a biased tracer of this underlying structure. Um, I ask you a question. Yeah. It is previous slide, previous the dark matter. What is this dark matter? Density of what in the blue filament of what are they? So this this is just showing the the, the density, the, the mass density in, in the the simulation from this. Dark matter density, what is it? So okay, so in the in the simulations, because we know roughly what fraction we need in, in visible matter and what fraction we need to have in dark matter. In simulations, you implement this as uh, some simulation particles so that will have some mass, um, and it, the, the ratio of the masses uh, of these simulation particles will be such that you have five percent in um, five percent uh, visible gas, if you like, and twenty-five percent that matter of, of this mass energy budget. Um, and within some simulation box of a given size, you, you know what. The total mass of that one is. So that will set the, the mass of your simulation particles. So what's happening is you start off with your box with some perturbed distribution of particles and you allow them to evolve under gravity. Um, and so over time they coalesce into these structures. So as I say, they're showing the, the density of, of mass in, in those parts of the question. Yeah, we can chat over, over coffee if you want some more details. Um, so, <laughs> and, and this, this simulation is 
I mean, to which extent they are absolutely solid, and to which extent they still contain some, let's call it the, the, the tricks like modifying interaction at small distances in order to avoid blowing up densities or something like yeah. that. So that they put the color, but I'm going to say, to which extent we can really be sure that this picture is qualitative and not only quantitative? Um, so that, that is still an issue, and it, it varies depending on the obviously the resolution of the simulation that you make, and obviously there are some limitations around how, how good our computers are that, that allow us to, to explore those different regimes. Uh, so on the, on the very smallest of scales, in terms of the simulation particles, we still have um, what's called force softening, where... That's what you said. Yeah, where, so on the very smallest of scales, basically that's to avoid uh, <clears throat> two-body interactions, essentially, two-body interactions, and having a physical effect. Because otherwise there would be some collapse, yeah? Otherwise, right. Otherwise, you might accelerate a very massive yeah. simulation particle to a physical sure. or something like that. And so that, that's a technique that's used to get around around that kind of problem. And but then, then, if it's a technique, it's not a very solid result. It, it means that on certain scales, you lose not trust result. Yeah. But they would be quite so you can calculate this. You can calculate what scales you would trust it. The simulation down to, but on larger scales, so certainly on the scales that I was showing in that visual depiction of the simulations, you, you could trust it on, on much larger scales. Um, and then, of course, if you want to get better at that, you would need to put more simulation particles into your volume and simulate at higher resolution so that your scales that you don't trust can be smaller and, and so on. And so, I mean, this, this is kind of where this is driving towards. At the moment, I'm still active research, but at, at some level, unless we get down to sub Earth mass simulation particles in the simulations, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to fully totally do away with this kind of trick, if you like, the technique. So, then why do we do the simulations? Of course, a lot, a lot of the calculations can be done for comparisons with models and so on. on on our linear scales and paper and to some degree, uh, do we do we really need simulation? Well, the answer is if you want to start looking at the smaller scales, and you, you certainly do, even though Lambda CDM has shown its success on very large scales, so it, it fits very well, the cosmic microwave well explains very well the cosmic microwave background on our Um It also predicts uh, various large scale structure structures, if you like, that we've, that we've seen or gravitational lensing statistics uh, predicts those very well. However, if you want to start looking at things on so-called small scale with a non-linear regime, which in, in this case, you, you start seeing the emergence of this on the scale of tens of megaparsecs, which is about 30 million light years-ish. Um, if you want to start looking at things on that kind of regime, where the density fluctuations on different scales start to couple together and the, the local interactions and dynamics become important. And that's where simulations really play an important role. And in particular, we see discrepancies emerging on what galaxy size and mass scales, which are about 10 to the 9 mm -hmm. solar masses. Um, so these are on the scales of small galaxies that are orbiting around our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and Andromeda, and others. So I'll present just a few here. If there are you get it from the night, or someone wants to make some points. Okay. Professor Bates, we said GM density can be a kilogram or a meter, meter juice. If we move it normalized to the background density of the universe equal to 0 0.3 times 2.775 times 10 to the 11 and so long as it's by uh, 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 mega step which is then white plot is actual actual over density which is easier to illustrate uh, 
Sí. Y dije, or, que dame la presidencia de ser actual, actual la gran gran, o dark matter is not known. So we only approximate it with the simplest, so we can get away with the complex. I'm not thinking about the complex. Yeah, that's what I think we're, I think that's, I think that's all that most of that. I think that's in real, this is the summary, it's the normal of the summary, okay. Um, but yeah, I'll pick up, pick up on that uh, over top, perhaps. So to pick on, Returning to the small scale problems with uh, the Lambda CDM model, it's performed very well on large scales. Um, but a lot of what we do is try to poke the model and see where it fails and see what that can tell us about the physics. Um, on smaller scales, um, drawing comparisons between um, predictions from simulations and observations, there, there are some problems that have emerged. Um, so the, the, the oldest and probably Original ones of these, I've picked on a few here. Um, so, starting on the, the left hand panel, this just shows the number of satellite galaxies that, as I mentioned, so orbiting around the Milky Way and M31. Um, so, if you, you count those up as a function basically of their mass and what on the spot, you end up with these uh, tripods here. So, these are observational data. But if you go into a simulation, gravity only simulation, Called that matter or a lambda CDM um, and ask the same question how many satellite or halos are there in these simulations that, that, host, that would host galaxies? You end up with this solid or solid line or these points here, which are an order of magnitude larger or this more discrepant than, than this guy. Mm -hmm. So we're predicting that there are, are more uh, low, low mass satellites than we observe. Is known as the missing satellite problem. Secondarily, there, there is uh, in this central panel, we can look at the distribution of the mass within galaxies. So, this is characterized in terms of the rotation and uh, velocity rotation curve, circular velocity rotation curve, which essentially is a proxy for the mass internal to some radius. Uh, and so we're looking at some low mass galaxies in our local universe here and plotting out the observed values by these points. If, again, if you go into a simulation, gravity only simulation, dark matter only simulation, and ask, well, what's the what is the distribution of matter in these low mass objects? Uh, it predicts a what's known as a cuspy density profile. So within the inner regions at low radii. Uh, the density scales of one over r. And that, this gives you this dashed line here, uh, which of course doesn't seem to be you know, very fit to the data. And actually, the data are better fitted by this, this blue solid line, which is a, a core density profile, which just means that the density in the, in the inner regions, in this case, um, well, scales as half of the zero, so it's a constant density core. Uh, so this seems to be, again, at odds with our best fitting. Uh, best fitting model that performs so well on large scales. The final one is related. So if you take, um, if you go out into the, the real universe and look at low, low mass galaxies and look at the peak of their rotation curves and plot the highest value over on this, this figure, you get the, these points over here. And conventional wisdom goes that in the most massive clumps of, of dark matter, you should be able to accrete enough atoms and baryons should be able to form stars and galaxies in this. And so you would expect that if you went into a simulation and picked out the largest halos from that simulation, uh, that their rotation curves, which are plotted in these uh, gray lines here, should line up fairly well with the, the peaks of the rotation curves from, from the data. And what we actually find is uh, these massive ones um, seem to over-predict over Compared to the data. Okay. What this implies, if we assume that the CDM is true, is that the most massive halos in the real universe, for some reason, fail to form any galaxies at all. It's known as the too big to fail problem, because they're too big to fail to form galaxies if we assume that the CDM is true. Now, in all of these cases, I've been drawing comparisons with gravity only simulations. Um, there's been no attempt to try and model complex and very rich 
uh, processes uh, that govern guys' information, the interaction of, of, of bounds and so on. And it turns out that if you, if you simply add some of this very complex physics in, uh, it has has an effect both on the distribution of dark matter and also uh, we, we realize, so for in the case of the distant satellites problem, that most of the low mass um, dark matter clumps that you form of the satellites around these objects just don't form or accrete enough material that you're able to form stars and galaxies. And the vast majority are entirely dark. Likewise, if we progress over here, adding very high physics in, uh, to our simulations basically affects and causes the rearrangements of material within the centers of these very low mass uh, objects. You find that it, because of how uh, feedback effects from the star and so on move material around, you lower the density profile of material in the centers of these objects. Uh, and it can do a pretty good job of explaining why uh, this is. The, the data represented better by a four here, for example, and why the peaks and the density profiles of objects are so low. Um, so there are a bunch of others. This culminated in, in the lab review that was taken that took place a couple of years ago that tried to classify actually how severe are all of these uh, problems that we um, have on small scales. And you can see that the, the ones I picked on, uh, even in the worst case scenario, they are at worst, they are relatively weak, a couple of sigma tension with the predictions about the CDM. If you try to account for much more complex galaxy formation processes. But one of the cases where we can't appeal to these complex and relatively poorly constrained uh, processes is, is a phenomenon known as satellite planes or planes of satellite galaxies, uh, which I'll just pick on, on now. Um, as, as a segue into the, the next section. So this is a, a currently outstanding problem uh, with the Lambda CDM model. Uh, and what we have here are the observed positions of satellite galaxies around the Milky Way on the left. So there's the disk of the Milky Way here, and Andromeda, or M31, the disk of that is over there. Um, where the satellites are approaching us, uh, are, relative to the screen at least, uh, I would mark them on the upper facing triangles where they're receding from us, I'd mark them on the upper facing triangles. And what this form basically is this, uh, these very thin planes of satellite galaxies. So the scale that this is on is one outside much larger than the scale that can be affected by the addition of galaxy formation physics, baryonic physics, and so on. So this points back more specifically to problems potentially with the uh, Lambda CDM framework itself. Um, and what makes these particularly interesting is that these are kinematically coherent. They're not just chance alignments of, of galaxies that we've given a, a disk to. They are kinematically coherent uh, planes of satellite galaxies. And so the question then arises, well, how common is this? And is, is this a problem or is this a fairly common prediction? Because so far in the Two, actually, the three closest massive galaxies we can observe have found these kinds of planes. And so we can use simulations to, to start to answer this question. So the next question is how how is that halo um, systems like the Milky Way and there's one our local group um, have kinematically coherent planes with at least as many members as we see in the real data, preferably at least as, as thin as well. Um, and the answer is somewhere in the region of 0.1 to 10%. It's quite a large spread. It arises from different methodologies in how you characterize these things. Um, and it's still hot and debated exactly what this number is. But either way, regardless of what the number ultimately turns out to be, you can conclude from this that the local group environment is somewhat unusual. And this is potentially problematic because it's the most well studied environment that we have the most detailed, most well-resolved environment that we can study. And often, for example, the Milky Way or M31 have been used as templates to understand the wider population of galaxies that fall in the universe. So if we're, if we're assuming that the Milky Way is typical um, and making comparisons between the larger population of galaxies in the universe 
then this means potentially that there is a problem. I mean, why is the main Milky Way is not your typical galaxy on these scales? So this motivates the need for one of those constrained simulations. Um, and really the, the, the goal with these is to understand how the local group environment affects galaxy formation processes, structural formation processes, and so on. And the goal is to produce local group analogs that are embedded in a large-scale structure that's consistent with the observations that we have from the OSU Lambda CDM. And we go about doing this um, using a, a Bayesian reconstruction technique based on observations of um, galaxies around us that allow us to probe the underlying gravitational field in order to, to reconstruct these different conditions. So there are two types of data that are used to do this, there's uh, galaxy redshift surveys, um, and the second thing, there's also uh, galaxy cubic velocities. So these are essentially the, the velocities of galaxies with the expansion of the universe, the like expansion of the universe attracted, which are which are modeled and reflected from a combination of redshifts and velocities. The latter typically are, are favored for this type of technique because. Galaxy redshifts and bottom down scales of the local group, which was classified, we will classify at least for, for astrophysical purposes as small scale. Uh, they have poor resolution on the, the scale of several megaparsecs, which is what we're interested in here. So, galaxy cubic velocities are what we use to constrain um, simulations. And basically, the goal is to produce these initial conditions that when you evolve them forwards, as I say, you produce these local group analogs. In a consistent large scale structure that matches what we see. Um, so, this is where the HST simulations come in. These are what I used in this uh, paper uh, last year. Um, it stands for High Resolution Environmental Simulation Intermediate Area. I did not create that acronym, so please don't blame me for that one. Um, and as, as I say, they're, they're designed using uh, the observation of the velocity field. To reproduce the major local gravitational sources in our in our local neighborhood, and it consists of thirteen magneto hydrodynamic simulations of the local group. So these are simulations where we've added in uh, prescriptions of ferromagnetic physics, magnetic field, and so on, um, at a population level to try to estimate how how this, how Galaxy formation will proceed in this kind of environment. Um, and three of which, three of these 13 simulations are simulated at high resolution. So these are just the names of those simulations. And the particle masses of these are, are, are evolved. So for the dark matter, it's about 10 to the 5 solar masses. And for the gas particles, simulation particles, it's about 10 to the 4 solar masses. So you're on these scales, you're you're essentially each simulation particle is modeling the population of, of stars or well, gas in this case, but stars and so on. And so if you run this through to redshift zero for, the, for these three, this is one of them, you end up with this kind of environment. So this is showing the uh, gas surface density of the of one of the simulations. You have the two host galaxies, the Milky Way and F31 analogs here. You can see a lot of uh, smaller scale galaxies and structures dotted around and the outside and of course you have the gas associated with both of those those halos and galaxies as well so this is one example uh, of the output from the simu from the SD simulations and in our case for the for the uh, for the paper that we were we published last year we're looking at this specific case of ultra diffuse galaxies in this environment so, as, as a reminder, I'll come back and define this a bit more technically. Ultra diffuse galaxies are uh, well, stellar masses similar to the very bright galaxies, satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Um, but their sizes are much larger, closer to that of the Milky Way itself, which means that they have very low surface brightness. They're very diffuse, um, and of course, therefore, very hard to see. And so, we don't have complete sensitivity yet. They're interesting because we don't fully understand how they form. And so this will be a, be a follow-on project for, for um, 
the, the simulations that we have access to now. <clears throat> the information mechanisms are not fully understood, but more, moreover, and perhaps more interestingly, um, they don't appear, or in some cases, they don't appear to have a large data component, which is thought to be an essential part of galaxy information processes and is a fundamental assumption in galaxy information theory. Uh, so this would be one of the easiest ways to, to show that the CDM is entirely wrong, the part of entirely wrong tree. If you can find uh, a leader G that's dark, dark matter poor, and you can show that it, this is how it formed from the very beginning. Um, so far, we've discovered hundreds of these kinds of objects in very large galaxy clusters. Um, but it's likely, as I say, because they are so hard to detect uh, because of their low surface brightness and so on, the sensors are likely to be quite incomplete. And so our, our best prospects for discovery is allowed to look much closer to us and perhaps in the local universe. And so this was one of the things we were trying to set out and, and work, work out um, with these constraint simulations was well, can you form the engines in the field of the moment? And an obvious question to ask is, well, what have we found so far? Um, and the answer is, well, not very many. And in fact, most of these are satellites of the Milky Way and others. There might be extra processes at play that can cause you to either lose dark matter or to make or to puff up your, your low mass galaxy if they're being interfered with essentially by the Milky Way and Andromeda. But we're, in, we're interested in the three that aren't in the sphere of influence of these two because they will tell us uh, if it was a very pure sample to start probing for the information mechanisms of these kind of galaxies. Uh, and so it, it's unclear. The questions we wanted to ask is, well, how many do we expect to find? And how many can we see with, with current surveys and with forthcoming surveys? Uh, and it's with Hestia that, that we explore those simulations. So the first thing we had to do was try to define very precisely what we mean by EDG. These are have traditionally been defined from an observational perspective. So there are different definitions floating around the literature. But we we use the definition that EDGs have to have stellar masses below about 10 to the 9 solar masses. Their effective radius, so that's the radius that contains half of their light, has to be larger than one and a half kiloparsecs. And their surface brightness has to be fainter than 24 magnitudes per square hour seconds. Of course. Astronomy being what it is, larger magnitudes means fainter. Um, but this effective radius definition clearly depends on the tail, right? The visible tail, the tail which you cannot detect or right? Yeah. I had a, a long conversation with observers about how they define uh, at some point just by chance I participated in an attempt to define the radius of a galaxy, and that was very Difficult, if not impossible, because it very much depends it depends on what you see in the neighborhood somehow, right? And uh, so, well, okay. Yeah. So then, what one technique that's often yeah. used is that you do some uh, profiles and assess the yeah, exactly. yeah. You choose some thresholds about how much to see, and, and usually that threshold is chosen to be the the background. The sky background, and you say, Well, once it's, it came to that point, then that's that's all you take into account. Which but then comes to the definition of the background, yeah. So, yes, so that, that, I think that's another ending story, but maybe I'm wrong. I just think that that's scattered knowledge of this in the follow up density exponential or polynomial, or how is it? Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't remember what the thought of is, I'm afraid. Um, I can check and we can chat over that. Because that is really related to, to the next question, mm -hmm. right? Like exponential is relatively easy to, to, to cut or to estimate where is the end, but, but polynomial is not. But the exponent value, the jumping value depends on the background, right? Yeah. Because the tail is hidden in the background, so. Sure. The nature defense itself. So, but if there's an observation problem, and we were in simulations, yes, I'm going to ignore it. I just need some comments about yeah. it. It really also depends on the type of galaxy you're looking at, because some galaxies have a very large extended uh, scalar halo, 
So sometimes you just cut it off. You say, I want to measure the radius where 50% of the light comes from. So this is the way of maybe using the same rule for every galaxy. And then you, you kind of just don't observe that that uh, external area. But you know, some, some people, they have other criteria to measure that. But for example, if you have a, a galaxy in the center of a cluster, which is very big, very bright, and has a huge stellar halo, it's basically impossible to, to say where it ends. You may have overlapping uh, galaxies within, yeah. but if you have, for example, uh, a spiral galaxy, it could be easier. So it really depends on the galaxy. Conscious of time, in a way. So, um, so these, these are the criteria we use. We also impose, because we're in a simulation, um, we also impose a requirement that each of the candidate galaxies must have at least 50 star particles, and that's so that we can characterize these quantities somewhat reliably, which is equivalent to imposing a lower mass of about 10 to the 6 star uh, solar mass. Do you need the simulation because of the galaxy you have 50 points moving? Yes. Yeah. Because we, if we were to try and do a more high resolution simulation, that would be, for these simulations, far too computationally expensive to do. So, why don't you use, you know, the continuous situation without points? So, <laughs> yeah. so you, you can also, the media. approach the, your uh, media as a continuous media. Why do you need 50 points? Uh, 50 points in the galaxy, something. Well, so the, 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 these points essentially trace that, that medium. So, the, we have particles, our simulations are in one of the simulations. We have simulation particles that, in this case, represent star well, populations of stars. Each one um, is 10,000 stars. Yeah. <laughs> So we're, we're just trying to essentially trying to say that to characterize the these quantities upon which this depends somewhat reliably. It's not arguably quite a 50 is enough, but that's what we use. Um, we also want these candidates to be outside the Vera radio, Mercury and M31, and within two and a half megaparsecs at the center of the local group. It's to facilitate comparisons with observations to some degree. And so what we end up with, if you look on this figure, basically everything in this upper quadrant is a filled symbol, um, is a candidate that's been selected and passes all of these criteria for each of these uh, simulations. Um, and so if you look in the simulation, so we picked one semi at random, the most the middlemost massive simulation. This is a projection in some parts here of the of the simulation, uh, looking down on the uh, two hosts, the Mercury and M31 analogs, where the the red represents the density of dark matter, so the green, which doesn't show up very well, is the gas density of gas, and the white uh, are, are the star populations. And I've circled the EDGs. So what this is showing essentially is that the EDGs typically, at least in the simulations, typically cluster somewhat close to the host halos. Of the local group, which is perhaps not too surprising. Um, but further away, um, further away, the fringes of the local group, they typically align themselves on the filaments and sheets that feed the growth of this local group. You also know, and I'll just draw attention to very quickly now, that the, the three simulations we have have, have different size, uh, masses, and the number of UDGs scales with the mass of these. So I'll mention it now, but I'll come back to this later. So as a, as a first pass, we want to look at uh, if, we, if we performed some surveys of some this, these local groups, what would we see? Can we see them in um, existing uh, surveys? So starting on the left, this is a plot of the, the, basically the number of UDGs normalized by the total number of UDGs in each simulation as a function of their brightness. So bright on this end, faint on this end. Um, and here we've applied the different survey brightness cuts corresponding to three, well, two surveys that have already been carried out and one that's planned uh, to see if, just on the basis of the surface brightness limitations of the survey, uh, whether we see the entire population or not. And you can see that for the most part, 
basically the entire population that needed to be recovered from these simulations. But then secondarily, we wanted to ask, well, these surveys also have a, a, an apparent brightness limit, limit as well. So if we place ourselves as observers in these analogs uh, and perform the same observation, construct the same luminosity functions, do we recover the full population of PGGs in each case? And again, we find that we generally are able to recover all of the entire population for basically all of the simulations with different um, apparent magnitude counts. So there's one key assumption in this that all DEGs are phase on, um, which isn't necessarily true in practice. And of course, this is a very crude way of doing these checks. Um, but in principle, the first conclusion we are showing that we may be able to detect or should be able to detect all of the DEGs in extant surveys, in you know, wide area surveys that have already been carried out. So this is more, you know, astronomers in the room, we have a spare few minutes and want to go digging through some archival data, this is exactly the kind of thing you can go and look for. Uh, we wanted to be a bit more sophisticated about this, so we um, tried to do a, a more realistic uh, mock observation of, in this case, the STSS survey using a, a response function that was published back in 2008. Um, modeled it very simply as a point of volume, uh, and in this case, we tried to account for, some, for the orientation of the EEGs. Um, which we did by assigning them a random volume for each observation that we did, um, which allows us to calculate a detection efficiency given the response of the survey. Uh, and this basically dictates whether the EEG is detectable or not as an EEG. And we carried out for each of the post halo analogs, 15,000 mock surveys, SDSS surveys in each case, in each simulation, um, which produced these luminosity functions over here. You can see that the, the number of objects we're recovering is a lot lower, and that's at least in part because a large fraction of EGGs are being misclassified as non EGGs because of projection effects. Um, you can see that we expect to find a handful at least of EGGs from, the, from these mock observations. So we, we've both shown that EGGs are formed in the local group. We should be able to find them. In, for example, the SDSS survey footprint, so you know, with, with a fairly sophisticated analysis there, so we should detect some. The final thing to address is the mass of the local group volume. And as I said earlier, the number of EGs is dependent on that local group volume mass. So there are other analyses that have attempted to estimate the, the mass of uh, the local group volume. And there's a, some techniques we can use to rescale the, the mass of the simulation to a common value. Um, and using some assumptions about the scaling between the mass of the volume and the number of galaxies that form in that like, sort of volume, we can also scale the total number of EGGs that we uh, predict there would be. And so for a most favored uh, local group volume mass of about 8 times 10 to the 12 cell masses. Um, we expect to find about 12 EEGs in the entire volume. So, as a reminder, we've found three of them already. Uh, we expect to find 12 in total. And in an STSS or a combination of STSS and the Dark Energy Survey footprints, we should see three. And LSST, you know, potentially when that comes online, so that would be surveying about half of the total sky, should see four of those. Uh, and of course, these are still affected by these uh, projection effects. Which cause the EGGs to be misclassified, and we don't try to correct for that. So, the conclusions from, from that work published last year, and this will be the point where I, where I stop um, as well, so we've shown that EGGs can form in a local group like environment uh, that is modeled very closely on the environment that we see uh, in the real universe. And there are, we expect there to be about 12 EGGs out there in the field for us to go and find, some of which could be seen in existing surveys and archival data, some of which, some more of which hopefully will be detected in upcoming surveys as well. A key thing for at least for astronomers in the room to take account of and uh, that we don't take account of in this is that the orientation of those EGs obviously affects the misclassification rate. Um, and the other thing which I haven't discussed but I'm just going to add here is that Galactic foregrounds could also suppress that detectability. So in these simulations, 
about 10% of the that are immediately population sit behind the genetic avoidance. So this is the Milky Way disk and the gas and, and so forth, and stars that sit in, in the foreground that could, could affect our ability to, to find some of these objects. So this can motivate other future work, as I say, the, the goal eventually will be to look at the formation histories of, of the objects in the simulations with a view for, to informing uh, our understanding of the galaxy formation processes as well. So I will leave that there. Thank you very much. So thank you for the talk, and now we have time for questions. So first, I'll be doing this. Uh, I have a question about the observation. Do you mean that uh, LSST you expect four in total or four additional ones to the one? Where the four in total. Oh, okay. So I think there's a little bit of overlap with the um, SDSS footprint, for example, and probably the data as well. So th these are viewed as into four. These numbers there in the end. Okay. And it's four and not six because you expect this like misclassification from the four. If if uh, you could account perfectly for this classification, then you would expect to see it. At least under these definitions, if you do. that's all. Other questions? Please. Yes. yes. Um, it's just a simple question. What is the typical age age distribution of uh, these galaxies? Are they mostly young or mostly old, or do you see them across all? I think um trying to, I don't think I have the slide in the next slides, unfortunately. I have a I'm gonna figure out I'll show you. I think they are well there's a mix, but I think they're mostly old. They're mostly old. Well, I'll find the figure. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what is the physical uh, reason? Behind having this diffuse galaxy. And what is the reason for having not diffuse galaxy? What's the difference in this? Well, so we have what we think is a good understanding of quantum day. Not a good understanding. Uh, uh, so a reasonable understanding of the galaxy formation processes that go into forming the normal galaxies. But as I mentioned at the beginning or beginning of the section, the formation mechanisms for these aren't well understood. It's not. With our current understanding, you plug in current descriptions for the galaxy formation into these kinds of simulations. Typically, you get out less diffuse um, galaxies. Um, so it's not entirely clear um, how, how these form. But if you take, at least in this particular simulation, and um, this is, again, this is, as I say, what we're going to be looking at the formation mechanisms behind these objects in this simulation. Which is obviously very dependent on the descriptions, galaxy formation, and baryonic physics, and so on, and its feedback from different bits that go into it. Uh, when you look at um, the GG population and this simulation, the implication is that for, the, for that mass range, they account for about half of the global population of galaxies in, in the local group, which is quite a significant fraction of objects to not really be both not understanding very well and uh, not being able to detect potentially as well. So for these, I, I think there, there is some discussion among colleagues about whether the, the feedback from star formation physics, so when you have stars kicking out, um, or stellar populations kicking out, um, stellar winds and, and so forth that moves around the gas and either prevents or, or moves around the sites of star formation. There, there's a thought that perhaps that's too strong in this model. Likewise for the, um, Feedback from the central central engine can actually go out to the nucleus in the center of the galaxy as well. Although this is less of an effect of these small mass, these smaller mass regimes that we're looking at. So it's a question of can we work out whether it's just a modeling error or effect from this model, or is this something more? Is it, is it closer to reality? And that's still an outstanding question. So I can't give you a more definitive answer. Than <clears throat> Do we have questions from the office? Okay. Yes. Yeah. I have questions from me. Actually, how many people is working simultaneously on the code? Is it a large community or you have 
Yes, so Hestia and Evra Group. Oh, yeah, actually, so Hestia is um, part of the Clues collaboration, and CO team is actually hosting the uh, co-hosting co the Clues collaboration meeting uh, later this year in, in June. Uh, so that's that's a fairly large collaboration, or it was a fairly large collaboration. And they focus on a lot more than just producing these kinds of simulations. I think there are about fifteen people that produce the simulations themselves. That's led by the leader schemes, et al. And then a smaller subset of them, plus me and a few others, uh, produce this work that uh, we're presenting today. Mm. So it's, it's, a, it's a good sized community. There are also some other communities, other uh, groups that are focusing on trying to produce constraint simulations better, I guess, they or not, than clues do, uh, or, or differently, perhaps, and just trying to model some of the, the processes as well. So. Uh, gas information processes as well. So, but, but yeah, about 15 odd people I think were involved in producing these simulations directly. And are there any other questions? If not, then let's be the speaker again.